Great. All right. Hi, everybody, and thank you for coming. Apologies for the slight delay. Um, so we've got a great talk for tonight. Uh, Trevor Bowen is here, and he's going to be talking about his work. Um, uh, again, this is a lecture series by the Space Science Lab uh, devoted to community college students, although anyone can come. Um, we're going to be having these again on the second Thursday of every month at 7 p.m. at the same Zoom link. Um, as you'll notice, you're all muted and have video off. We ask that you do that throughout the lecture series. But if you have questions throughout, please direct them to Tim Quinn, who's going to be introducing Trevor in just a second. He's also going to be moderating the discussion at the end. So please send all questions to him. Um, and so now let's send it over to Tim to introduce Trevor. Tim, you're muted. Well, good evening, everyone. And again, apologies for the technical difficulties. Um, the first thing I wanted to do was go ahead and show you a video that we've put together at the lab. Um, you should be able to see a YouTube. Um, Claire, give me a thumbs up if you can see the campanilla. Yeah. All right. Okay. And um, this is going to give you a little overview of the Space Sciences Lab, where uh, both Claire, myself, and Trevor work. And uh, then I'll come back after that and introduce Trevor. Working at the Space Sciences oh, Laboratory. I'm start that over. Here we go. Working at the Space Sciences Laboratory, or as we call it for short, SSL, at the University of California, Berkeley, lets us create and operate satellites, rockets, and balloon experiments for our research. Think of it this way. We make stuff that goes into space. That requires some high performance engineering. There are over 200 of us working here as scientists, engineers, project managers, students, and more. With our annual spending at around $60 million, SSL supports a wide range of research projects that need our special engineering, fabrication skills, or large-scale facilities for success. Our lab has strong partnerships around the world with university research teams, government centers, and the aerospace industry so we can collaborate to create precision instruments for all kinds of cutting-edge scientific investigations. Are your skills a match? How many people can say their work is in space? All right. Well, with that introduction to the lab, um, I'll go ahead and introduce Dr. Trevor Bowen. He's a space physicist at SSL, Space Science Laboratory. And he's gonna to talk to you tonight about interpreting satellite measurements of space environments. So I will stop sharing. Trevor, you can go ahead and share your screen. Awesome. <clears throat> so I'll, yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit and I'll start sharing some slides or something. So I guess, uh, so I guess a part of this is talking about sort of careers and how we all got, people at the Space Science Lab got to be here. Um, so I started actually doing uh, sort of getting involved in space research when I was in high school, uh, kind of sort of randomly as a sort of out of nowhere. I actually was a very bad student, failed out of high school in my first year and kind of ended up going to a vocational school where um, they were sort of like trying to get people into getting internships and sort of pragmatic experience or experiential learning. Um, so where I, I ended up sort of getting involved in this sort of science uh, sort of program or just basically it was just like a glorified science fair or this is science fair. But I sort of ended up uh, working with these guys at University of Colorado um, mapping river valleys on Mars uh, when I was like 16 or 17. And I guess this was that was kind of like when I was sort of decided that I wanted to actually, I don't know, do school and get good at learning stuff and do math and science. I thought it was really fun. Um, so I think the, so the main thing that I've found in sort of just being a scientist and sort of like the, the sort of got me on this path is sort of just following opportunities with sort of internships um, and sort of, you just 
getting involved, getting hands-on, because a lot of the stuff that we do at the Space Science Lab and just space research in general or space engineering in general isn't really stuff that you can learn in a classroom or in sort of a traditional educational setting, but you really need to have sort of hands-on research doing that type of thing. Um, let's see, so let me share my screen. Uh, so I put here, so if you guys are, whoever's out there, listen, I think this is a, I put this, this list of good sort of internship programs that I know of um, that I, I've actually done a couple of these and I'll talk about them in a second. I think, you know, if you're, if you're really interested in getting involved with space in any way, getting, you know, hands-on experience is the way to do it. And there's tons of organizations out there, both sort of government, university, as well as just private companies that are very, you know, willing to train people and have them learn the skills that you need to become a good, you know, someone working in the space industry. Um, so in college, I went, I actually went to this tiny, tiny, tiny school with no research program. Um, that was kind of in the woods in Vermont that no longer exists. Um, it was sort of an experimental educational project. Um, but so one of the things I actually benefited from being in a place without having, you know, a research sort of on campus was I was very much pushed out and sort of forced to like find other opportunities and places to do research. Um, so that's kind of what sort of, uh, let me see if I can, presentation mode. Can you see the presentation mode? Yeah, cool. Um, <clears throat> So I guess, so I kept getting kind of pulled back into sort of space research. I don't really know why, it just kind of kept happening. So I ended up with doing this research experience for undergrads, REU program at uh, the Smithsonian Institution, Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, sort of looking at images of solar flares using these extreme ultraviolet telescope that's called AIA. Uh, and if you've seen a picture of the sun in the news or media or basically anywhere in the last 10 years, it was probably taken by AIA and it's this nice, you know, beautiful, like fluffy clouds of solar activity. Um, so I worked there for on and off like a year and a half in sort of various capacities and then sort of uh, realized I wanted to go to grad school or kind of knew I wanted to go to grad school, but that was sort of the, you know, between finishing my undergraduate degree and sort of figuring out that I actually wanted to, you know, be a scientist and do science. Um, so I ended up, you know, I, I kind of wanted to like look around and see if I wanted to do something else other than, uh, so, you know, space science or solar physics or heliophysics. Uh, and I ended up uh, working at, uh, sorry, uh, Los Alamos, I was about to say the wrong lab, uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory, which is in New Mexico. Uh, this fusion experiment where, called the plasma liner experiment, where they're sort of, basically what they're trying to do is uh, accomplish fusion by taking a, a whole bunch of different rail guns that fire plasma in, and then you'll fire one rail gun first that will have fuel in it. And then the rest of the, the guns can fire and compress that to a small point. So this is a long time ago. And I actually hadn't really thought about it in a long time until I was putting you know, these slides together. I came, they've actually, I think when I was working on it, there was one rail gun, the end goal is 30 and now they're up to six or seven. And so it's an interesting project, but you know, what I really realized is I like doing space. I like the community, I like the type of problems. So I sort of uh, decided to move back to doing space research. Um, so I started my PhD, or well, that's maybe a little, started my PhD in 2013 uh, and I graduated two years ago, uh, 2019 or a year and a half. Um, but so I, at University of California, Berkeley and in physics. And so I sort of realized that, you know, I, I had this, you know, I'd been doing space research for a few years and I kind of liked it. I kind of had a leg up on sort of the material and kind of knew that it was something that I was familiar with and liked. So I was kind of just like, let's dive into it and just do a PhD doing this type of research, which is very fortunate for me because it lined up almost exactly with the uh, Parker Solar Probe, which Dave Glazer talked about last one of these talks, maybe a month ago. Um, so I did most of my PhD work sort of uh, doing instrumentation and calibration on uh, the hardware that we fly on this instrument. Uh, and, you know, this is an actual uh, video from the launch and this was, you know, it's like really fun to go and like see something that you've worked on for, you know, five, six years, just flying to space. Amazing. Nothing else like it. Um, great time in Florida also. It's a, you know, it's a big, it's one of the best parties you'll ever have is when you shoot something in the space. Um, so I did my PhD working on Solar Probe, which is uh, launched August 2018. 
it's this uh, satellite that uh, Dave Glazer talked about that was basically going to take the first in situ measurements of the solar corona. So it's going to fly very close to the sun and measure the actual sort of plasma that's there. And sort of that's what I actually am here to talk to you about in terms of the science of sort of what I do and what the corona is and why we do what we do. Um, so here's a quick outline. So I'll just do a quick introduction to the sun, the solar atmosphere, and this thing that we call the solar terrestrial connection. Uh, then I'll talk about what is space plasma because it's a word that gets thrown around a lot if you're gonna to talk to people working in space plasmas. Um, I'm talking to you about measuring what kinds of things, talking about what types of things we can measure in a plasma and what these measurements can actually tell you about the physics that's happening inside a plasma. Um, <clears throat> so, right, so here is a picture of the sun and I'm not sure how they took this, but they definitely took it from the ground. Uh, so it's on the NASA astronomy picture of the day from last, you know, from July, 2019. And you can see the International Space Station right here flying past it. And so this is what's called the photosphere. And maybe they, you know, maybe they photoshopped this a little bit. I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> so the, what we're really familiar with the sun that you see every day, that every day is the sun, is the photosphere. And it's this sort of, you know, yellow ball that's at, has some temperature characteristic of a few thousand degrees that's very, 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 very just spherical. Um, but what your eyes don't really see is the atmosphere that sort of comes above it. And so the layer that exists right above the photosphere is called the chromosphere. And it's this highly structured stratis strat strat uh, stratified uh, portion that has a lot of just you know, movement and jets and activity. But what I'm gonna to talk to you most about is the solar corona. So I guess, right, the, the corona you can't really see at earth unless there's an eclipse. And this is something that you know people have you know observed forever and have all types of you know theories or about what it is. Uh, and it's too faint to be right. So it's too faint to be seen without an eclipse or an, even really an occulting disk. And today you still really need to be above the Earth, the Earth's atmosphere in order to actually successfully observe it. And this is just because the light from the sun is too bright, and the white light that you actually can see from the corona just gets obfuscated from it. So the thing that's really fascinating about the corona is that it's actually at millions and millions and millions of degrees, uh, maybe a million degrees, not millions and millions, but much, much, much hotter in comparison to the uh, solar photosphere or the chromosphere. And so this, the solar atmosphere, the corona, is sort of characterized with this rapid increase in temperature and a rapid decrease in density. And so there's a much less matter there than when you go close to the, very like close to the solar surface, but it's very hot. Um, and for, you know, for reference, the radius of the sun, so here's 10 to the five kilometers, the radius of the sun is, you know, off the scale even. So this is, right, so one radius extra over from the sun, and you're already in this entirely different sort of, uh, you know, regime of a very hot, diffuse uh, plasma or gas, and we'll talk about that shortly. Um, so something that you know, you can obviously see is there's all this structure to the corona. Whatever's coming off of it, it's not just some, you know, spherically symmetric blob or atmosphere, you know, like the Earth's atmosphere. There's actually some, something going on with it. And if you, so what people notice really early on is it looks just like a dipole. So if you take this picture of a dipole, you plot it right over it, and, you know, it basically seems like there's some dipolar sort of structure to the sun. And in, in reality, it is just magnetic field. And it's the magnetic field of the sun that gives the atmosphere this sort of fine structure that looks you know, beautiful. Um, let's see. <clears throat> so this, uh, so the, the corona varies. There's lots of variation. And this is, I'm highlighting this little, this project that uh, some collaborators of ours that, you know, that I share an office with. Uh, worked on a few years ago to image this eclipse, the 2017 Great American Eclipse. Um, and what they did is they crowdsourced sort of amateur citizen scientists all across the United States in order to make this, you know, long sort of composite movie of the eclipse. Like in any given location, you can only really only see the corona for a few minutes, but if you take a bunch of you know, citizen scientists all across the country, you can make a, you know, this long movie that lasts, you know, corresponds to actually hours or maybe an hour or so. Um, but so the idea is like, even though like each image is different, you can see that there's some variation to what happens to the white light over this time. Um, and so the variation of the Corona is something that is highly impacts earth. And it's something that I would like to talk about. 
to help you understand why we do what we do. Um, so the solar cycle uh, is this thing that you may have heard of where there's kind of an 11 year uh, periodicity with solar activity. Uh, and one of the first things that people ever really notice about the sun is that there's these blemishes or sunspots that occur. And if you count the number of sunspots or the amount of area that they cover the sun, you'll see that they peak uh, every 11 years and then, and then they go to cycle and there's very few. Um, and so this periodicity is one of the first things that people really ever notice about the sun. And they started recording, you know, 400 years ago. And so this is something that, you know, it's, it's limited information about what's happening on the sun, but it's still, it's a long record in comparison to sort of high resolution stuff that we have today to look at. Um, and so the solar cycle, uh, there's, there's a signature of it in the magnetic field of the sun. Uh, and so over, so over the solar cycle, the sunspots, which are actually, you know, signatures of the magnetic field, uh, move downwards in latitude. So what this is, is it's a sort of plot of, uh, average magnetic field as a function of solar uh, latitude, essentially, uh, as a function of time. And so over the solar cycle, you can see that sunspots move closer to the equator and then they go away. And then 11 years later or whatever, approximately 11 years, they start back up. And something that's actually interesting is like the, the leading polarity uh, flips. And so the, this 11 year cycle that we see in the sun is actually 22 years. Uh, and you can see it flip. So it's like the leading polarity here is blue, the leading polarity here is yellow. Uh, and then it takes, you know, this repeats. So this is a very slow variation of the magnetic field of the sun. Um, but there is actually, and the end of the corona, but there is actually high, you know, rapid changes that we can observe as well. Uh, so this is a video from high C in AIA. Uh, high C is actually a rocket and it, a sounding rocket only flew for a few minutes. And what they did is they tried to focus on one little active region, see what they could find. And so this is down to, uh, I think each one of these pixels on the right side of the high C is about hundred kilometers. And so you can see that the time scales are actually evolving on minutes and these very, very, very small structures. Uh, and these pictures are both in ultraviolet wavelengths that correspond to about 20 million degrees. So what we're seeing is this very, very hot plasma that's evolving you know, very, very rapidly. And it's, you know, it's long, it's very large distances in terms of what we understand of, you know, this is thousands of kilometers, but it's really fine and small compared to what we can actually observe on the sun's surface. So this fine structure um, is a lot of what we actually experience with the solar terrestrial connection. And so we have this really hot plasma that's in the solar atmosphere and we want to, in, in truth, it really does affect Earth, and I will talk about this in a second. And basically, if you have a million degree plasma that's very diffuse above in the solar atmosphere, the gravity of the sun can't actually confine it in, and it can just blow off uh, just because it has so much energy, it's just not actually bound to the sun anymore. Um, so Parker in 1958, for which Parker Solar Probe is named for, uh, came up with this theory um, that there should be a supersonic solar wind. And that given that the temperature of the corona is at millions of degrees at Earth, we should be immersed in this supersonic flow that's, you know, something of, depending on how hot the corona is, somewhere between, you know, hundreds of kilometers a second. And this is very fast. And so this is an animation of the solar wind, which we now know is real. And this is one of the contributions that Parker's made to the field and which we, there's plenty of things saying Dr. Parker. I'll leave it at that. Um, let's see. All right. So, so there's a supersonic solar wind. Uh, and if you are familiar with shock waves or supersonic flows, uh, perhaps you're familiar with the jet engines or supersonic jets, uh, and you know, the structure that forms around them is essentially identical to that, which we see around earth. And so earth is basically this, you know, small sphere in the supersonic flow and it creates this bow shock. And this is a huge part of what sort of uh, governs the Earth's magnetics or the in the plasma around Earth. Um, so in 19, in the early 1960s, there were some, a few satellites, the first satellites flew that actually were able to cross this and they were able to measure this hot wind coming off the sun that sort of has a, you know, 100,000 100, degree Kelvin temperature, uh, 200,000 degrees in Fahrenheit, at these scales, they're just pretty similar, um, with a Mach number of 10, and which is 0.01% the speed of light, which is actually very fast. 
Um, so at these speeds, it actually takes, you know, this wind three to five days to travel from the sun to earth. Um, so one thing that this wind does is it hits Earth's bow shock as it drives turbulence. Oh, no, I'm just so in hydrodynamic turbulence, if you, put a, if you put a ball or a sphere in a very fast flow, the wake of it will sort of develop uh, these sort of characteristic spiral vortice, vortic, vortic, uh, vortical features, which are just familiar in sort of turbulence studies. And so this same phenomena is what we actually observe in the plasma around Earth and the solar wind. The difference between these two though is that this is a plasma and it's very different fluid than what you actually have in just typical hydrodynamics. Um, let's see. And so as a brief aside away from Earth and talking about Mars, this supersonic solar wind is actually what uh, stripped Mars of its atmosphere. So there used to be oceans on Mars uh, and Mars had a magnetic field. But over time, the supersonic solar wind was able to rip it away and remove a lot of the atmosphere in the, wall, in the ocean that's on the surface. Uh, for us, on Earth, we're still protected by this large dipole field, which is one of the things that separates Earth from Mars and sort of their planetary evolution. This is the reason people study Mars. Uh, so it's sort of comparative planetary physics. Um, okay, so back to the Earth-Sun connection. So we, I showed you this figure or this video earlier, these you know small knotted sort of lines where they're highly structured moving together. And so these line, these field lines, these magnetic fields sometimes lead to large eruptions. And basically what happens is they can get too close together such they wanna reconfigure really fast. And because energy is conserved, that sort of energy, uh, the energy conservation results in sort of the emission of uh, highly energetic particles in mass. Um, in, in large flares, uh, you can actually generate they can carry a lot of mass, and this is something that we call a coronal mass ejection. And during the CM, a coronal mass ejection or CME, and during a CME, what happens is, you know, there's a bunch of mass that gets left ejected out from the sun into the solar wind, and it gets carried through the solar system. It can impact Earth. Um, ooh, yeah, there we go. I'm just showing all these NASA videos. These are really fun. There's actually a search engine on the NASA website that you can go and, you know, type in any search word, and it'll bring up whatever video matches and they're all kind of fun to look at. Um, so how we on Earth experience these CMEs are through geomagnetic storms, and in particular the aurora. So the aurora, sort of what happens is if there's the right configuration, this ejected mass uh, can, or just particles from the solar wind that aren't even sort of energized or shut off from a flare, can just sort of enter Earth's atmosphere and impinge on the atmosphere. Um, and this leads to these sort of auroral features, the aurora borealis. Um, and so it's long been known that these are, you know, strongly entwined with what the solar activity. Uh, so this is something that, you know, space weather, this is space weather that can affect satellites, can affect airplanes, communications, and something that people are very sort of interested in understanding uh, how this connection uh, takes place. I am going to, I think, I'll play this one real fast. So the ori original ideas from the Aurora that actually just really like this uh, video came from the idea that the earth has a uh, dipole magnetic field. And so this guy, Bierman, I believe, was just like, let's put on, let's make a dipole field and blast it with electrons and see what happens. And it was basically able to create Aurora. Um, I think it's a, I don't know, it's, it's a very, it, it demonstrates the simplicity of the actual sort of physics that's happening here um, with the Earth-Sun connection. Um, let's see, next, where are we? So I guess in terms of research and what we want to understand about the corona and the Earth-Sun connection, we really want to know why the corona is hot and we want to know what processes accelerate the solar wind and what processes create solar flares. Uh, we want to know how the solar wind comes off the corona and we want to know how it evolves and interacts with the Earth. And so how do we do this? With measurements. So I think this is the, a huge part of what space physics research is and what space science is, is it's trying to make measurements around planets, between, between planets, uh, and eventually maybe the interstellar medium, which maybe we'll get to at the very end. But um, the idea is the measurements are the tool that we use to sort of understand any of these processes. 
And so very broadly, a uh, measurement process can be sort of categorized, categorized into two different sort of flavors. One is remote sensing, which I've shown you a lot of uh, pictures and videos up because it's really pretty uh, and really nice. And that's a you know, useful intuitive way of understanding what's actually going on. Um, so, but what remote sensing fundamentally is doing is it's relying on emission of photons or light to observe properties that are distant. And this contains a lot of positional information, like you can see where these sunspots are, you can see where they're moving, you can understand when they go away, when they come, but you really are relying on the actual uh, light from the sun to be able to do this. And in contrast, a lot of research is actually done using in situ measurements. Uh, in situ is Latin, I think, for in position, uh, and it sort of refers to diagnosing sort of intrinsic local properties of uh, a plasma or of a gas or whatever, or even whatever you're trying to study. I think when I was, you can even refer to, yeah, just any, anything in situ just means in position. Um, let's see, so why do we actually need in situ measurements and why can't we just rely on these sort of pretty pictures? Um, well, really the resolution of these nice pictures is very poor in terms of, in comparison to what you actually want to understand of what's happening in the dynamics of the plasma. So each one of these pixels in this picture here, uh, in this movie here, is something like 10,000 kilometers, whereas Earth's radius is only 5,000 kilometers. So small scales is sort of like, so if you go back to that, you know, figure where you can see all the turbulence developing around the Earth, you can't really resolve that type of phenomena with these instruments, these visual instruments. And even high C, which has, you know, this actually the highest resolution images taken of the sun, the, uh, the resolution goes to 100 kilometers per, per pixel. And that's something that's not actually sufficient to resolve, you know, there's always smaller scales. And what we really want to understand is these sort of kinetic dissipative processes that are happening at the smallest of scales. Um, let's see, so what is a plasma? So I think I've been throwing this word around a lot because I take it for granted because I've been studying it for a long time. I think it's really important to sort of contextualize what it is I'm actually really talking about. Um, so we're pretty familiar with gases and liquids and solids. Uh, these are commonly called neutral states of matter. Uh, and what that means is electrically neutral, where ions, uh, which are positive and electrons which are negative, are bound to each other with electromagnetic forces. Uh, this is just traditional opposites attract. Um, so here's my cartoon hydrogen atom. The solar wind is mostly hydrogen uh, with plus and minus charges bound together and just sort of stuck. So if you keep adding energy to a gas, essentially, you will eventually get it hot enough that the positive and negative charges have so much energy that they split apart. And so they don't actually have want to be around each other anymore because they're just too hot. And so the ionization energy of a hydrogen is something around 150,000 degrees Celsius, which is, you know, basically what we're seeing in the solar wind and in the corona is much higher. So everything that's coming off the corona is totally ionized. There's no sort of, nothing's bound together. Everything's kind of separate and can move in part individually. And so neutral, neutral gases, uh, typically collisions between particles uh, are what govern the sort of gas dynamics. Uh, and, you know, we're familiar with gases that have properties of temperature and density and pressure. Um, but in plasma, you have, you know, these same properties of temperature and density, but you also have the sensitivity to electromagnetic fields. And this is because, you know, when they're, the, these atoms or molecules are bound together, they're, you know, the, the, the plus and minus uh, equal each other out. Uh, so when you actually separate them, external magnetic fields or electric fields or the electric fields of the collective behavior of many of these particles act together to make very complex behavior. So these are the only equations I'm gonna show. And I basically just wanted to highlight, um, you know, what you actually can measure in a neutral matter, fluids or gas, as opposed to in a plasma. So in a fluid or a gas, what you're gonna measure is density, velocity, and pressure. And this is you know, basically, just conservation equations. This is just a conservation of mass. This is a nice fancy way of expressing the conservation of momentum. And this is a, a equation of state, uh, P equals NKT, if you've studied that in chemistry before. Um, but in a plasma, now that you have these electromagnetically sensitive particles, you have to worry about things like electric fields and magnetic fields and currents and all the stuff that you might learn in a class about circuits or a class about uh, electromagnetism. 
And so there's all these phenomena, right? So basically these three equations, one, two, three, are the same for this sort of type of plasma and fluids, but you have these added sort of properties that you really need to understand. It makes the dynamics much more complicated. Um, so what can you measure in a plasma, right? So I guess I'll go back real fast. Right, so what can you measure? So I'm highlighting density, velocity, and pressure, as well as currents, electric fields, and magnetic fields. So when you're building a spacecraft and you want to study these things in space, you have to make sure that the instrumentation that you're putting on the spacecraft is actually measuring all of these different properties. And so Solar Probe contains two different sort of in situ suites of instruments, which measure electric fields and magnetic fields uh, from the fields instrument, aptly named. Uh, and then the sweep instrument, which actually study, which studies the density and velocity of protons. And from the, you know, the velocity of protons, you can measure things like uh, temperature, et cetera. Um, let's see, blank slide, wonder what is supposed to be there. Right, interpreting in situ data. So I guess, right, so in situ data, it looks a lot messier and it's a lot harder to actually understand what's going on a lot of the time. So I put this nice plot here from, this is the first sort of presented result of when a satellite left Earth's bow shock. And what they did is they just, this is from Explorer 10 to 12, I think. And this is how they confirmed that the Earth's magnetic field is actually a dipole. And so what they did is they just measured the magnitude of the magnetic field as they flew through and they plotted a sort of the profile of a dipole magnetic field against it. And they say, ha ha, it's a dipole. Um, but what they also were able to measure, and this is the first measurement of the sort of presence of the Earth's bow shock, where there's sort of this discontinuity and these change in the sort of angle of the fields as well as the magnitude. Um, so these, so when I go and look at in situ data, uh, it can be very ugly. But this type of stuff is really important to, you know, it's a bunch of wiggly lines, essentially. Um, and it's sort of, there's a skill learned and sort of just understanding what they mean and how to interpret them and how you can actually extract information from them. And this is something that people have been, uh, you know, it's, it's a science, uh, have been perfecting for the last, you know, 20, 40 to 40 years. Um, so I just highlight how ugly in situ data is, but it's very important. Um, all right, so in situ measurements really allow us to understand these small scales and plasmas that you can't really resolve with uh, images. Um, so one thing if you, that you can see with these small scale sort of uh, measurements is that often the velocity field to the flow of the plasmas moving around is basically exactly tied with the magnetic field. So this top here is the magnetic field. This bottom set of panels is the flow, is the velocity flow. And you can see that they're basically exactly the same. And so this is something that's characteristic of alphane waves which is a particular type of wave that plasmas can uh, sort of support. Um, and in general, it's not actually a single alphane wave. It's not just a sine wave that you see, but there's some wave spectrum. Uh, there's a bunch of waves interacting together. And this is basically what we call turbulence. Um, let's see, so turbulence in the solar wind. Um, so it's essentially random fluctuations. So turbulence is nice because it gives us a tool to sort of understand these sort of single point measurements that are hard to, sort of interpret in terms of just, you know, looking at some little wiggles and trying to figure out what that actually means. Um, <clears throat> so it's in, the, in turbulence, it's basically a set of random fluctuations with energy distributed over a range of scales. And sort of when you're taking, when you're sampling, it sort of corresponds to a spacecraft sort of taking a cut through that fluid. And so if you were to fly this, you know, model solar probe through all this turbulence, you're gonna end up with some bunch of wiggly lines that look like this. And so the individual sort of dynamics of the of what happens are typically stochastic, which means unpredictable, but typically statistically properties exist. And those statistical, statistical properties can tell you a lot about what's happening. Um, so there's this subtle complication where it's actually quite hard to sort of discern spatial and temporal evolution. So if I were to fly this, you know, spacecraft flew through this plasma, this turbulence at different times, you're gonna end up with different wiggles. And it's gonna be hard to tell whether or not something has to do with where I actually sampled it or how it's evolved in time. Uh, so basically the total measurement that you're gonna make in a, from a spacecraft is due to changes in all the spatial variation of the plasma, sort of just, you know, how this sort of turbulence is over this spatially distributed, and then also how it changes in time. 
but the uh the, the fact that the solar wind is supersonic actually helps us a lot because of what that means is that the time variation is very small because it's moving so fast so when you do this uh no let me go back slide so when you do this cut through it um, let's see no well let me play my animation again so when you do that cut through it you're actually just sampling a bunch of stationary structures um well, my animations are all all over the place um and so in order to, so if you wanted to actually resolve spatial temporal measurements what you really need are multiple spacecraft and this becomes very expensive to do and just impractical in many cases. But around Earth, people have done this with sort of constellations of four or five spacecraft and sort of by measuring the same structures at different times. So these are these each one of these dots is a different spacecraft. This is from Themis, Themis A, B, C, D, and E. And so if you fly through the same thing at different times, you can get an idea of how this sort of time, uh, the time evolution of whatever structure you're flying through has. Uh, I don't know. Let's see. So, right, so like I said, so the turbulence that you're flying through, the, the satellite flies through is essentially uh, frozen in. You're just, you're just measuring spatial structure. And so uh, there's this concept of a spectrum. And the spectrum is basically tells you how power energy is distributed in that set of structures uh, in some sort of sampling range. And this is totally anal analogous to a sound spectrum. Um, this is a screenshot from my garage band or something where you have a, you know, just some sound waves and there's some spectral features below it. And so what we do is we essentially just try to sample these fluctuations and look at what the spectrum is because the spectrum will tell you a lot of stuff. Um, and I think I found this file that I sonified from solar wind turbulence a while ago. And it doesn't sound very pretty, but this is basically what this type of this red noise spectrum would sound like if it were a sound wave. Just, you know, random, random fluctuation. Hopefully that's not too loud. Um, but right, so I guess the point is, is that the spectrum will, you can actually learn a lot about the spectrum by changes in the spectrum. So one of the things that we know is that the, that the heating that happens in the corona isn't actually just localized in the corona, but it has to be care, but it, the temperature profiles that we measure in the solar wind indicate that there's lots of heating that's occurring as it propagates to earth and sort of, this is actually an AU, so throughout the heliosphere. Um, sort of throughout the solar system. And so without heating, you'd expect some temperature profile that looked like this red line. But the fact that you have a different temperature profile basically means that you have to be injecting energy somehow. So one of the things that I have been looking at with Parker Solar Probe is specifically how the spectrum changes uh, at various distances. So basically how the different structures carry energy and what we can infer about heating. And so often, uh, what we see is that there's the, some anomalous steep spectrum that are indicative of of energy being removed from the system. Um, let's see, right, so this is basically exactly what Solar Probe was meant to study. Um, we are essentially trying to fly into the corona to be able to measure these heating processes. Uh, and the way we would do this is sort of with these Venus gravity assists where we you know, you fly around and sort of have some resonant interaction with Venus and we can drop our altitude a little bit closer. Uh, so what this plot is on the right here is it's uh, all these E1, uh, E4 and E6 are sort of various distances. So we're spiraling closer and closer and closer into the corona. Um, and let's see, I think I should have a plot. Uh, and so one of the things we really want to understand is where is this boundary between the solar wind, which we're in over here, and where is the corona? And so the way that we'll figure, we'll just sort of determine this point, is we'll find out where the wind becomes supersonic. And so what we're really trying to understand is where is actually this boundary um, between the solar wind and the corona. And this is essentially, this is called the alphane surface or where the alphane speed or the alphane waves are sort of moving at the same speed as the solar wind. Uh, I'm trying to wrap up here, but so the, I guess the idea is that there's this surface there where at some point the solar wind is supersonic and you kind of see it here, this is Z minus thing, where at some point all these waves are moving away and at some point all these waves are moving forward. And what we're really trying to understand is what are, what's happening, what is the spectrum of these waves when you go in and where does it actually invert? And so, right, so I'm sort of trying to wrap up here because I think I'm running out of time. Um, 
but the idea is we want to, so the goals of PSP are essentially to measure in dissipation and heating processes inside the corona and to understand how the sun powers the solar wind and the solar system. And we really want to understand what makes this barrier between the solar wind and the solar corona. And the in situ measurements that we're using can be hard to interpret, but they're really, you know, we can't do this with sort of white light. There's actually a white light. Well, maybe, let's see if I can, there's a, uh, so here's some nice white light images from Solar Probe. But you can see you can't actually, this is what, there's no, you can't sort of resolve these sort of small dynamics of what's happening. It's sort of just, uh, I think I have another one. This one's longer. Do I have another one? There we go. All right, so here's here's the remote image here on Solar Probe. And what you can see is there's a lot of sun, or sorry, a lot of stars, and you can see sort of the edge of the sun coming off. But this sort of you know small structured stuff that you can sort of see in situ data just isn't really quite there. And so these are the measurements that we're really trying to take to help us understand sort of what's happening uh, in the corona. Um, let me go back. So takeaways, I guess uh, what I'm really trying to sort of hit home with here is that the sun and the solar atmosphere are a lot more complex than what we can really see with our naked eyes. And that we really require these sort of uh, complicated uh, instruments flying on spacecraft in order to understand what's happening. Uh, so the solar atmosphere actually functions basically to create our entire solar system. It blows out and makes the solar wind. It's actually what separates us from, you know, the intergalactic medium um, or interstellar medium in the galaxy. Uh, and so this, and in making this solar wind come out, it sort of is, the sun is sort of having this sort of, there's this intrinsic connection between its atmosphere and Earth. And this affects uh, humans through space weather and technology and satellites and everything and whatnot. Um, and the sort of the many types of measurements that we try to use to understand these processes, uh, you know, vary in their nature and what they can actually help us, you know, learn about the sun and sort of trying to integrate them all together and sort of making a cohesive picture about what we actually know about the sun, what we want to learn is sort of the goal of all of this research. And this is what we do at Space Science Lab. And so I'm done. And you can ask me any question you want. All right, thanks, Trevor. Yeah. Yeah, folks, feel free to put your questions in the chat. We already have some questions in there. And let's start with the first one from William. And he just, you had mentioned Mars losing its atmosphere. So William is asking, well, will the supersonic solar wind strip away Earth's atmosphere after a long time like Mars, or will we always be protected by our dipole magnetic field? So this is a good question. And I think, um, so one of the things about Mars is it's somewhat smaller than Earth. And so the idea is that, so Earth has this active dynamo and what dynamo basically means is intrinsic currents inside of it that make the magnetic field. And so Mars basically froze over because it was, it's much smaller. What's interesting though, is that Venus, I'm giving you a non-answer and I apologize. Venus doesn't actually have an intrinsic magnetic field, but Venus has a very thick, thick, thick atmosphere. And so it's not as simple as, you know, a the, we, there's some magnetic field that we want that we have, and will you know it protects us. Even though it's easy to say that, but it's actually the, the the processes that are happening or that cause atmospheric loss are fairly complicated, and it's not totally well understood. And this is one of the things that we actually do at the Space Science Lab. There's a mission being led to fly two satellites to Mars to sort of understand. Uh, sort of exospheric, exospheric loss from that planet. Uh, so in short, the answer is, I think we're safe. And I think, um, you know, the time scales at which this happens, it's, you know, very, very, very long periods of time. And, you know, we'll, if it goes away, we'll figure something out. Got it, thanks. Okay, here's a question from, from Jonathan. Uh, could you repeat what uh, your understanding is uh, about where the solar where the solar wind becomes where it becomes supersonic? W what does that tell us? So that is okay. So that's a very interesting. I feel like this is a hot topic, and this, this is kind of one of the goals of Solar Probe is essentially to figure out what that point is, and it's not necessarily even a point, but could be some sort of diffuse sort of surface. And it's also not clear what is actually making the solar wind supersonic. We know that it, the solar wind is so hot 
that even in the most sort of simple cartoon model, it's not stable for it to have its sort of plasma confined. And so, so you imagine it, you can think of it this way. The galaxy has zero pressure out really far away from the sun. There's basically nothing there. It's a vacuum. The sun is very hot and very dense. And so there's just a, pre there's just a pressure differential between what's really far away from the sun and what's close to the sun. So it just sucks it out. But because the, in, in the, that's an easy story to say and to explain and to do it in sort of a very broad sense to like work it out on paper. But the sort of fundamental sort of kinematics of like how energy is getting taken from the magnetic field to actually heat up the particles and accelerate them isn't something that we understand. And I think it is a good, it's, it's good that you noticed that I didn't have a good answer because I think there isn't actually a solid answer for that yet. And that's sort of, you know, one of the reasons we have expensive space missions like this. Got it, thanks. Um, here is a question related to, you know, pursuing academics. What advice would you give to someone deciding whether to pursue academics as a career, especially someone in a non-traditional path of education? Um, well, I think, so I, I, you know, so when, like, so I, I remember when I was like in high school, I never, I didn't think I'd go to college for a while. Um, and I think for me, what really has kept me going in it is that I really do like it. And I really think it is something that I am good at and can, you know, bring, I have something, it's, it meshes well with my sort of goals in life and what I value. And I think, you know, it's, there is, it's, it is um, staying in acad academics or academia for a long time can be hard and very depleting, but it can also be very rewarding. And I think it has to do with what you, you know, making choices and trying to understand yourself and what you value and what you want out of uh, a life and a career and what you're interested in. Um, and I think that's really, you know, it's sort of, uh, this is, this is, I think, sort of academic research and sort of pursuing education is it's a very, 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 someone's ringing my doorbell, I don't even know. Uh, it's very, very sort of individualized in a way where uh, it's not sort of, everyone's path is different in it and what everybody learns is different and everybody has their own experience. And that's something that makes it really interesting and valuable, but it also makes it uh, hard, it makes it one hard to give advice because everybody comes from a different experience. And it's, you know, it's not a, you know, Fortune 500 company where there's a, someone hands you a packet on your first day and says, you know, this is your hiring paperwork. Like it's the training is something that lasts forever. Uh, like I'm still learning. Like Claire, I, I showed Claire this presentation yesterday morning and I was like, ah, and then it wasn't so good. And then spent some time working on it. It's all a learning process. I think you deciding whether or not that type of learning and just continuing to do, being open to learning is really what you want to be. Okay, here's uh, a question sort of maybe in, in a similar vein to that is, um, <clears throat> what is your best advice for someone with, with little research experience or none, but who wants to get involved in space science research? So making that, making that jump and just doing something. In the, in I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's really, like I, like I hate to say it, but you really just gotta go do it. I mean, that's kind of the, there's opportunities there. I mean, I think it's everybody I know is like super, you know, very busy and maybe not actively like presenting that they like have opportunities, but, you know, just go out there and see what's out there and try to find something that looks interesting and good. And I think that's kind of the, the best advice I can give is sort of there's in, I mean, at least another thing, I think people in academia and in, in general are, you know, pretty, they spend all their time learning. They like other people learning too. It's sort of like a big learning club. But I think it's sort of the, just finding, you know, just even one opportunity to someone that will just be like, yeah, intern, just do an internship. Or you know, I think even coming to stuff like this and getting a better idea is like, that's, these are, that's the steps to do. And I think it's straightforward. Um, 
all, you know, I've made all this list of internships and I'm sure there's a lot more, but I think I can, we'll find some way to distribute them or you can screenshot them and I can go share them again, my screen in the end. Well, th this, uh, well, this is being recorded, so the recording will be available, oh, okay. so if, you know, folks can get access to it that way. Um, well, maybe here's uh, one last question. Um, so how do you actually work with data from satellites? Do you need programming experience? So I would say you need to, I mean, so I think it's, you don't have to be a software engineer, but you, you have to be able to learn you have to have some amount of knowledge of like how to, you know, read in data. So basically what happens is, so this entire, everything that I have on my computer, you know, was measured by these analog sensors, gets digitized, put in sort of our, you know, fields recorder. Uh, Tim knows all about this. Then gets put into a sort of uh, hard drive that's on the spacecraft then gets beamed to like another satellite and beamed to another satellite and beamed to a giant ground station that's maybe in Australia. It's put on some server at NASA that then we get, and then it's like this entire chain. And so when I actually get the data, it's, you know, just a bunch of numbers and sort of, I don't have to like write all the code to sort of do the in and out processing of transferring data across, you know, the solar system but i you know there's a certain amount of just sort of having to like open a python script and make a plot and you know type some numbers and take a Fourier transform and i think it's, it's one of those things that's once you get doing it it's pretty intuitive but it's there is a you know there's a learning curve but it's not insurmountable um we actually just got one more question in the chat uh, from Jonathan, who was asking, why is turbulent solar wind random? Why are there random fluctuations in energy? Uh, okay, so this is interesting. So it's not necessarily random in the sense that it's just like, it's it's like rolling a die in a sense where it's like in some way that like when you roll a die, it's a three because it's a three, but you don't know it's gonna be a three. You have a one out of six chance of it being a three when you roll the die. Um, and so when you're making these measurements, you don't know what exactly is going to, what you're going to see next. So, but there's some, and so what turbulence actually does, is it gives you sort of a probabilistic sort of framework in order to interpret those measurements. And it's not that it's just sort of some, it's not like quantum mechanics where it's just some being spontaneously generated with some random probability. It's sort of that it's very hard to, you know, you can't just predict what's going to happen next. And so the, everything is just probabilistic. Um, and that's sort of the way that you can make the best progress and sort of understanding what's happening is just through understanding sort of, you know, the probability and the statistics of what's happening. Sort of like which end of the elephant are you trying to touch? You know, the blind yeah. men, you know, touching the tail and somebody else touching the, it's not, not as coarse as that, but. Right, yeah, well, yeah I mean, <laughs> that's very much it. It's like, it's sort of like, it's, you know, let's go, oh, I'm not sharing my screen, but it's like, I showed that nice pretty picture, like, you know, that's of the turbulence and like, that's a, you know, model that's run on a fancy supercomputer and they have nice resolution and can sort of make those, you know, pretty plots of what's, you know, the dynamics that's happening. Whereas when I have a spacecraft and I fly through, I get a single number and sort of trying to explain like that sort of rich sort of picture of turbulent fluid dynamics is very, very, very hard to do when you have a single number. And so when you have a lot of single numbers, then you can start doing it statistically. All right. Well, uh, Trevor, thanks a lot for giving a, a, a great talk and thanks everybody for your questions. And Apologies for the technical difficulties, which led to actually <laughs> the wrong uh, Zoom ID went out. Um, and um, that will be remedied. Uh, this also, this is going is recorded and will be made available um, on the Space Science Labs website. And once we get that uh, location set up and, and last month's talk and this month's talk and then 
subsequent talks will be on the web on the web website available to you. And uh, and if you know anybody who might have gotten the bad link and wanted to show up here but didn't, uh, just let them know that um, the recording will be made available. All right. Well, thanks again, Trevor. Yeah, thank um, you. Guys. Feel free to send me an email if you have any lingering questions. You want to drop your email in the chat so people have it? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm about to email or I'm about to send it to Tim privately, so I'll not do that. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to run, but thanks a lot. Okay. okay. Good evening. Thanks, Trevor. Bye. All right. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Yeah. We'll sign off. Yep. Good, good, good night. Good night, all.